Howdy. Hey, hi there. Here it is. The big one. The penultimate entry to these projects of mine. Thanks to everyone who's been part of this run so far, and everyone that'll be part of it even when I've moved on to different franchises. Every like, comment, and subscription has helped in its own way to propel this creative endeavor of mine forward, and given ya Australian boy a twinkle of hope for the future. Deep thanks, of course, to the YouTube fam. Maya, Chex, Hammers, Snug, and Blood. All good lads, makers of good content. Go give them a look. A further, final thank you to close this chapter of the channel out with this franchise goes to White Light. Most of you know exactly what this man did for this channel, and I'll always be grateful for it. Thanks, champ. Just like how I'll always make a few minor mistakes in the future, just like I did in part two. Firstly, cement wasn't invented in 18th century England. We've got records for that hard ground stuff dating back to ancient Rome. Large scale production and a more refined chemical mixture, however, along with industrial quantities didn't happen before the 18th century. Secondly, Queen Victoria wasn't the oldest monarch in the world. Louis XIV has her beat for that title, but she is the longest reigning queen in history. Now, let's quickly cover the differences in these three games before I start on my normal rambles with them. These are big games with very long stories and a whole lot of side content to invest your time into. So if I don't mention a particular side quest, item, or or character that you were hoping for, don't get your knickers in a twist, because you'll look like a child having a tantrum. Also, I'll be touching on the DLC a little bit, like a sliver, like if I enjoyed a thing or moment, I'll be saying so, otherwise they won't really be spoken of. Why? Because all of these games tried my patience at their own points and I'm not up for wasting more time than what's needed. I'll be covering the main shit and mechanics, just not 100% of the entire fucking game. So if that or anything else I say in this video irks you, get fucked. Now then, with that asshat stuff out of the way, let us never sleep and wait in the shadows and I will kill you all. Everyone who sniffed the air that day in Siwa! Assassin's Creed of House Origins was developed by the A-Team in Montreal, with a little bit of help from Sophia and Singapore, being pushed out into the world in October of 2017. Not that long ago, if you really think about it. Origins is a milestone in the larger franchise for a few main reasons. The first of which would be that Ubisoft made the decision to move away from the open world action adventure formula and make something much more akin to an open world RPG, complete with character levels and status effects on weapons and armor ratings and all that good shit. This totally wasn't because of the incredibly successful Witcher 3. So successful in fact that both Ubisoft and CDPR were blinded by dollar signs forever after. Because if it could make a buck, Ubisoft wants in on it. Why do you think they make Just Dance every year? This blinding with dollar signs probably contributed to the second notable thing about this slice of Assassin's Creed. The promotion and involvement of one Ashraf Ismail. Ashraf is a piece of human trash. But when this game was being hyped up, he seemed like the head honcho the franchise needed to right the ship and rekindle the flame that had made people fall in love with the idea of Assassin's Creed to begin with. Too bad he's a scumbag. Stop talking about stuff that isn't purely about the game, you shill. Where the fuck? are we meant to be for this hashtag dead game? Thanks for asking, you poor rejected child. Assassin's Creed Origins was initially thought to be taking place in ancient Egypt. This, however, along with a setting in feudal Japan, was called the worst choice by Alex Hutchinson, creative director of Assassin's Creed 3. Feudal Japan was considered a bad choice. Even further proof that Ghost of Tsushima was the biggest fuck you Ubisoft has ever witnessed in their entire existence. The final setting for AC Origins was Ptolemaic Egypt. Yes, it's pronounced Ptolemaic, not 
Ptolemaic, you filthy plebs, with the final date being set to 49 BCE, a rather prime slice of Egyptian history if for no other reason than you had three different cultures coming together at one time. Those being Egyptian, Greek and Roman. Some would say that Roman culture is just a later stage of Greek and my response would be shut your fucking mouth. The Ptolemaic Kingdom was founded with Ptolemy I, who would have guessed. Ptolemy was a general who fought for Alexander the Great, the historical embodiment of the phrase, what have you done with yourself lately? For a quick overview of how important the Ptolemaic dynasty became when Alexander finally died, this is the territory of Alexander when he was maybe, probably, more than likely poisoned. And this is the chunk Ptolemy got for being a bro of bros. The remainder of Ptolemy's life was spent in a massive bro-off called the Wars of the Diadochi. And if I tried to explain that fucking mess, I'd be a history channel, so I'm going to ignore it. The main thing you need to remember is that the Ptolemaic line ruled Egypt for close to 300 years. This game takes place in the sputtering death throes of this once great dynasty. The popular figures you might know from this slice of happenings in humanity's timeline are none other than Julius Caesar and Cleopatra. Julius Caesar being one of the most historically significant and important Romans to have ever existed, and the one you probably learned about in history class back in school. The gross simplification of who exactly Julius Caesar was isn't one of the easiest tasks, however. By the time Caesar died, he had no less than five triumphs. Technically five anyway, because one of his triumphs was held against fellow Romans. Four is the more commonly accepted number in the history community for that reason. A triumph is basically a day-long celebration in the city of Rome for the achievements in the campaigns of the general in question. Normally, that general is celebrated by his men as Imperator, because winning the approval of the troops under you is generally a very good idea for any general to have, most certainly in the case of a Roman general, being that you could literally be stabbed in the back, possibly in the middle of a battle, if your soldiers didn't have confidence in your abilities. For reference as to how good five triumphs actually is, the next closest Roman general, based off my flimsy research being a gaming channel and all, is three by Pompey the Great. Caesar managed to beat Pompey in a civil war, ending with Pompey being killed in Egypt, funnily enough. Which is a nice coincidence because Egypt is exactly where Cleopatra was born, fled from, came back to, made herself famous, and then died in. Not really doing much more than being some sort of beautiful as to work her way into the beds of multiple powerful men over the years and only ending up killing herself at the end of her very cursed reign in Egypt, capped off with floods, famine, and a shit economy. Once she heard that her then lover, Mark Antony, killed himself because of the fake news that Cleopatra was already dead. The part that's important to this game is that Cleopatra wants to get into Caesar's pants because power and regaining the throne or something. I didn't pay attention to the clamoring of a power hungry harlot. There's an excuse you're given in the actual story of the game as to why you're helping her, and I'll be talking about that in the actual narrative section. The key twist here is that you don't play either of these people, but a rather a fictional accessory to a few of the more notable scenes between the two. Mainly that one story about Cleopatra coming to Caesar in a rug. Speaking of the game, let's drop the boring history and talk about how you'll be killing pixels for the next few hours. The first thing I know, I fucking know, you people will bring up in the comments is the new combat system. Thankfully, it's not cursed with the traditional counter kill that plagues the earlier entries in the series. However, it's instead adopted the fiendish coil of something akin to Dark Souls. Target based lock on, both a dodge and a block that with finer timing can operate as a parry. Enemies that, if given the chance and level difference, can put you into the ground rather easy. It's also a fucking terrible combat system. What? But, but, you're not allowed to hate both the counter kill system and this Souls Light system. You have to pick a side. Actually, I can hate both. 
because there's one good example of a third person combat system that a few games have done, and Assassin's Creed still hasn't even touched it yet. A system that relies on player skill, has room for growth towards the skill ceiling, and is still fucking fun to use. It's called free flow combat, as seen in Batman Arkham series, Mad Max, The Shadow of Mordor games, and most recently, and to very bloody good effect, Ghost of Tsushima. Can you get into a blocking chain that will eventually kill enemies with that combat system? Absolutely, but at the rate enemies actually attack you with those systems, you'll either be killed or never have a combo counter higher than 4. And with those high paced combo heavy systems, less so in Ghost's case anyway, the higher the number, the more damage you put out and more special moves you can use to thin the herd a bit quicker. It doesn't give you a crutch to lean on, but gives you all the tools you need to fully utilize the system. So in my full opinion to sum up for the asshats in the comments, both of the combat systems used in Assassin's Creed are bad systems for third person combat. And if you want to get angry at that opinion, get fucking used to it. This series isn't going to get any better for you. This is also a good point to remind you that Ubisoft saw the dollars being bought in from The Witcher 3 and said, fuck yeah, some of that please. So not only did they emulate the style of combat, but also the level and stat requirements traditional to RPGs and not open world action adventures, which is where AC makes its bread and butter. So almost every enemy you fight has a chance of dropping loot that you may or may not be able to equip, which will also have stats tied to them that directly dictate how much damage you can deal. Thankfully, your armor at the very least has a semi-traditional upgrade system. This would also include your your quivers and wrist braces, along with that trademark neck poker, exchanging stuff like animal hides and raw metals for damage reduction or addition, respectively. But if your pockets are feeling a little bit too heavy for your liking, you can use the inbuilt microtransactions to get some real nice weapons and cosmetics. Alternatively, you could save your money for when you actually need it. But if people did that, Genshin Impact wouldn't have the following it does, because money-grubbing gambling tactics are fine, so long as there's a waifu or husbando at the end of it. Derailing back to the current topic, not only does each and every weapon have their own stats and effects tied to them, but most of them play different from one another as well. If you wanted to get in someone's face, using the daggers is your best option, but sometimes you don't want to get into someone's face. Well, the heavy axes will be your best friend. I mainly used the swords because you can actually use this wonderful thing called a shield with those, and a big ol' axe for when I want to use the overkill power and just delete someone from the earth. That's another thing that's been changed since the good chunk of this franchise. You don't naturally gain more and more abilities as the story progresses. You can just run around and slaughter enemies on the way to knocking down some side quests and turn into an overleveled god by the time you tackle the actual story. These abilities can be pretty useful, like the aforementioned overkill. Some of them should have been a standard feature, like a secondary weapon slot, and some of them are silly and a bit stupid, like the ability that can let you control your arrows in mid-flight. Something, something, blame it on Isu magic or something. The traditional story and side mission structure has been changed since the last chunk of games as well. No longer do we have specific mission types that are anything akin to what was from yestergame. There's no assassination contracts, thief contracts, or fighter contracts that task you with killing a random person in the various cities around the map or anything like that. The closest thing there is now is the stone circles that ultimately serve as a bit of closure for Bayek himself. Bayek is the beautiful man you get to follow around this neck of history and watch him blossom his way to second place on the Assassin's Creed power rankings. And those stern circles also serve as a really good speedway into the worst part of the game. Inside of Origins, Bayek takes up the role of a Medjai, with a bit, or a lot of help, from his faithful bird Senu, who is best bird. The Medjai was a legitimate role in history, one taking the place of a sort of elite police force. Not the American kind of police force, however. Not regularly, anyway. Along the way of plot progression, you'll run into people who need a bit of help or an errand done. Good thing Bayek is 
a sweet lad, because 9 times out of 10, he'll help you out with whatever you need. Just don't try to double cross him later, because it's gonna end badly for you. This police work can bring down the pace of picking apart the Order of the Ancients, which is the overarching thread you'll be chasing over the course of your playtime, and unlike future entries in this generation, is the core focus of the game itself, not a time sink that only has a sliver of its overall size dedicated to the plot, and is designed to leech time out of the player's hands, making the time saver microtransactions a lot more of an enticing offer. As I briefly explained, the game can be split with the mainline stuff to experience the latest in the clusterfuck that is the Assassin's Creed storyline, and generally just being a good dude to help a few people that you come across in your travels across the length and breadth of the larger Egypt area. The biggest kneecapping to this aspect of Origins is that none of the side quests really stick out, aside from that really out of place quest where some dude from Final Fantasy XV just shows up for a cutscene, then paces out. That should tell you how far Assassin's Creed has fallen. Easter eggs and shoutouts are cheeky little things to have in games and they're at their best when they're subtle. Sort of, if you know, you know. Not hijacking the game for a moment to show off a full character in a style that doesn't suit the game you're actually playing, and in a manner that's only suitable for the question, what the fuck is this doing here? There's maybe the little scorpion cult side quest I remember doing that took you around the map chasing down someone who desecrated the dead and did a very bad job at mummifying their corpse after they were done with them. That's maybe the one side quest that I can really remember lasting more than a single mission. Sadly, the main missions don't fare too much better, as the only ones I really remember playing through is the Aya ship missions. Also, real quick, Aya, best girl of the franchise so far. This is an inexcusable fact. You're welcome. Whilst the ship missions can't hold a candle to the ones featured in Black Flag, they're fun enough that I semi looked forward to them if only for Aya and a shakeup in the gameplay. The rest of the campaign missions are on a varying level of tolerable to not good, generally allowing Bayek to wheel down the many members of the Order on a quest to kill every single one of the bastards. Although, I did see one very basic twist coming a mile off, and I'm surprised that Bayek didn't see it as well. There's nothing to really be spoken of in terms of neat gameplay features as the story rolls along, aside from the different upgrades you'll be choosing as you progress both main and sideline content. The locations, however. Oh lord! I fucking love games as a rule, but I love Assassin's Creed for a special reason. There isn't another group of games I can name that does a better job of just dropping you into a historical world, one where the research has been put in to make it as close to the back in the day real thing as we can get it, and then just telling you to go nuts. Ptolemaic Egypt is a sight, whether that's out in the flat deserts, the rocky outcrops around the pyramids, the various oases you visit, the pyramids themselves, Memphis, or the swamps along the Nile, or even the big boy city of Alexandria itself. It's all very pretty. However, Egypt and Alexandria can't hold much of a candle to a location featured in the DLC. And yes, this is the point I'm mentioning the DLC. While The Hidden Ones is nice for people who like the lore and care for that sort of thing, Curse of the Pharaohs? Just look at these areas. Giving your location designers some actual historical locations to map out is good. Giving them an ancient mythos and teaching them about the culture it's linked to is even better apparently. Just like how letting a composer return to handle the soundtrack is generally going to yield better results than we first expected. The returning champion for this composition in Assassin's Creed is none other than Sarah Schnarchna, I still can't say that name properly, who you should definitely remember from her work in Unity and Black Flag. Being no stranger to the series, it feels proper that Sarah's comp, especially her only solo outing in the franchise, is, at a glance, downright fucking memorable. I won't call it great, because I can't hear any native instruments being used over the course of the listing itself, but it is a 
damn fine composition from top to bottom. A nice blend of hefty combat tracks and slower, more somber tracks that you'll hear either as ambience traveling the world when specific moments in the plot occur or when you boot up the game. There's a sort of ethereal floating nature to this track. Being that this is the first track you'll hear when you open the game every single time, it's not a bad start by any measure. Then it picks up with the horns laced on top of the strings, with the brass section giving it a nice solid oomph to scorch that melody into your brain. Every time I hear that little alternating horn chord, I'm transported back to Egypt, playing as the Magi on his quest to hunt down the killers of his son, and along the way, create an idea that surpasses time itself. But naturally, it can't all be smooth sailing, and sometimes people need to get bopped on the head so they don't try to stop you after the first time. A good dose of tribal drums is always a sound method of letting the player know that they've walked into a fight, but using a bit of acoustic guitar to play tag with it, that's striking a particular balance that can make this type of track special. One that's more than just a dull loop that plays every time you break out the fisticuffs to teach a hippo what for. But of course, being an Assassin's Creed game, especially one that came out after 2009, there's a specific track that Ubisoft likes giving to its composers and telling them to take their own spin on. Sarah is a very, very good composer in my eyes. Not on the same level as Kid, but that's purely based off the fact that I can't really listen for anything that sounds distinctly native to Egypt. But on the merits of making me feel immersed in the world of Assassin's Creed Origins, she couldn't have passed with more flying colors. Extending past the soundtrack for a moment, I want to give credit to two more people for their sound work, Mr. Salim and Mrs. Wilton Reagan, the voice actors behind Bayek and Aya respectively. This pair have put the work in and deserve a very large chunk of the credit for getting me into this game and story, not only for their individual moments throughout the narrative, but when they're on screen together, it's like chicken and mayo. They work so well together, it's tough to see them separated, and unfortunately for a sizable chunk of the narrative, they are separated, especially at the end. The narrative, like usual on this channel, can be summed up with a sentence. Bayek's son is accidentally killed by his own hand, so Bayek goes on a revenge spree to kill everyone involved. He succeeds. Being an Assassin's Creed game, however, especially one written by a dude that was writing for theatre up until this point, there's a bit more to the plot than an oversimplified summary can give. The narrative actually kicks off with Bayek shouting at an absolutely shit-scared man. And I'll be real, if this boy carved out my name on his arm with an arrow, I'd be shitting a brick too. This man is one of the members of the Order of the Ancients. Not for that long, however, when Bayek makes sure that his mask won't be coming off without a bit more effort than before. Leaving the lovely tomb you were in after a little tutorial scuffle, you meet Hepsiva, Bayek's main homeboy not named Senu, who gives you a place to rest up for a brief time after having just spent a year trying to track down one of the five masked men present at the event that kicked all of this off. But we aren't up to that plot point yet, so keep your panties on. During this resting period, Bayek brushes up on his archery and stealth skills before embarking on his quest to take down the next member of the order, the local priest, Medunamen, who's been torturing those in Siwa for information on a mysterious vault. Bayek, 
takes so much issue with this fuckhead abusing such power in his home stomping ground that he proceeds to cave his skull in with a very familiar looking rock. But not before having a little flashback to show us all the reason why Bayek wants to commit a murder spree right about now. Taking his new prize, Bayek receives a letter from his homeboy Hepsifer, the contents being a booty call from Aya, telling him to come to Alexandria so they can have a chat. Bayek then buggers off in the general direction that his wife told him to go, because Bayek is a smart boy who listens to his female partner. And if you're like me, he'll also see a few hallucinations in the desert along the way. Upon arriving in Alexandria, Bayek pretends to be a sneaky boy and gets into contact with a few of Aya's local friends, who are helping her track down the rest of the order. Once reunited with his wife, Bayek and Aya compare kill tallies, narrowing their list down to the assumed final member of the order, the snake. Before leaving to begin his investigation, Aya gives Bayek a nice little blade that I can see causing a bit of pain for the wielder if they don't use it properly. An experience Bayek very much has once he figures out that the snake is the royal scribe. Finding the man at a bathhouse, Bayek does the thing. The thing that apparently became a tradition afterwards once the Hidden Ones became an actual organization and all that. Also, just quickly, I know Bayek is a tough bastard, but this scene? Yeah, I think he's going to do a bit more than grunt and wince at the pain shooting down his feet. Finger. Anyway, linking back up with Aya, Bayek gets to meet Cleopatra, who showcases in the first scene you meet her in why she probably wouldn't be an effective ruler, because having sex parties probably isn't the best use of your time when there's more than a few problems being spread around your kingdom. Regardless of this, Bayek agrees, with a little bit of pushing from Aya, to help Cleopatra regain her throne from her brother, if for no other reason than he gets to kill a few more Order members as payment for his trouble. I'm going to blitz through the rest of this story, that's how much I care about it. The Scarab is the leader of Letopolis, who has the bad habit of leaving people in the desert to torment them a bit. He's so good at his job that Bayek didn't see the betrayal coming, even though most people playing this game would know that anyone with a name and a non-generic model is a bit sus. While Bayek is doing the actual groundwork, Aya goes on a boating trip to recruit Pompey the Great as an ally to Cleopatra. She succeeds, but not before before sinking a few big ships. The hyena is a crazy lady trying to fuck around with Isu technology to bring her dead daughter back. Rather than scouring the ruins for some information or other goodies, Bayek just stabs the crazy lady and bugs out. Onward to the lizard, a man who thinks that poisoning people to drive them into his arms is a good idea. This is also where Bayek and the player learn that the Order of the Ancients isn't restricted to Egypt and has a bigger picture view outside of that one lonely kingdom in Africa. Just like how the crocodile is probably pretty fucking lonely considering she uses the combat arena to train and dispose of her soldiers just so that they can be extra violent when she needs a pair of hands to deal with any sort of rebellion. Thinning the Order's herd a little more leads to more and more names popping up, with two members you'll be concerned with in this arc, being the Jackal and the Scorpion. Problem being, both of these dudes sit right next to Ptolemy the 14th. To further compound the problem, the Roman civilian war has arrived in Egypt, and when Aya and Bayek go to meet up with Pompey, they find him more than a little bit dead, so they go with Plan B. This is where you get to see the famous queen in a rug routine you heard about in history class. Moving forward from this, Caesar agrees to help Cleopatra fight against her brother, who has backing from the Greeks, thusly leading to a big old clusterfuck of a war breaking down in and around Alexandria. During this smashing of bodies and breaking of friendships, Bayek kills the Scorpion, gaining an insight to the future Templar Order, peace through order at any cost. Bayek then makes a quick beeline for the Jackal, who is very much up for a scrap. Caesar, however, is not, of course stopping this fight to the death because the Jackal is a Roman, not one of those Egyptians. So he'll be taken back to Rome for trial or some civilized shit, I guess. He'll even give Bayek a good hard smack across the chops just to make sure he can do it. While that shit is going down, Aya makes a play to kill the young Ptolemy, but pussies out at the last minute. The gods disagree with this cowardice, however, and feed him to a few crocodiles. Now that Cleopatra has her Roman boy toy and the throne of Egypt, she dumps both Aya and Bayek to the wayside, not really having a need for them any longer. Not only 
only that, but she's also let the jackal back into the inner circle of the royal court, which makes getting to the bastard so you can put a knife in his neck pretty much impossible. Being rightly miffed at this, Bayek gathers together the various friendos he's made in Alexandria since his arrival and forms the basis of the Hidden Ones. Kinda, sorta, not quite. In the process of doing this, however, Aya finds out that there's another member of the Order outside of the Jackal, the one called the Lion. Chasing a lead on the Lion to the Tomb of Alexandria, Bayek and Aya discover that it's actually Flavius, the right-hand man of Caesar, who's controlling the Order. And now, thanks to Apollodorus, former bodyguard and boy toy to Cleopatra, not being that great in a fight, he's also got the Apple of Eden, on top of taking the Isu staff that was hidden in Alexander's tomb and buggering off to Siwa, where everything started to open up that vault from the start of the game. So, of course, Bayek and Aya follow him, laying a smackdown of giga proportions and having a nice little cutscene between Bayek and his son, who he accidentally killed at the start of the story, if you remember right. Rightly, just to send Flavius off to reserve a seat in hell for Caesar. Then you've got the best scene in the game between Bayek and Aya, coming to terms with the fact that their wants for a better Egypt are wasted, but can be applied for the rest of the world, even if their love must be sacrificed in the process. To attain a higher standing, operating in the dark, and making the corrupt think twice striking at the most deserving targets and righting the injustices of the powerful. Thusly, when Bayek drops the eagle skull that's been hanging around his neck the whole game and Aya picks it up, we see where the symbol for the Assassin's Creed actually began. Yeah, I like this whole cutscene. It's pretty good. As a bit of a wrap up, Aya sails to Rome with the help of some characters named Cassius and Brutus, I'm sure they're not important, to murder the Jackal, determining along the way that Caesar is on the path of corruption and enacting a bit of revisionist history by taking the first stab in one of the most famous deaths in human history. Later on, Aya magics her way into Cleopatra's bedchamber to give her the subtle warning. Then be the ruler our people deserve, or nothing will save you from my blade across your throat. In the following final cutscene, you get a monologue from Aya laying down the basics of the Hidden Ones, leaving Bayek to form his own branch of the Creed in Egypt while she stays in Rome under a new name, Amunet. A pretty nice nod to one of the statues in Assassin's Creed 2 that lets you get Altair's armor, noting that she killed Cleopatra with a snake. Good little nods to the existing lore like that litter this game, and it's what makes it feel like an Assassin's Creed game. Oh yeah, there's also Layla Hassan, she's the Desmond replacement, but she's even worse doing a whole lot of fuck all in terms of impact on the overall plot until her phone a friend is killed off screen and she needs to jury rig a hidden blade to kill some randoms, which is enough to impress William Miles, Monday leader of the Assassins and Desmond's father. So he just invites her to join the Creed. Roll credits. The narrative does drag on a little bit and ends up feeling a bit hollow compared to other entries in the franchise. Is it the worst? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. But save for a few select moments throughout its plot, Origins doesn't really impress much at all. Again, there's nice little moments in there. Bayek using the hidden blade for the first time, some of the actual acting is pretty top notch, the carpet scene. There's even a scene or two from the DLC that made me simp for Aya because bad bitches are always lovely. It's just that the core guts of the story didn't have much pull with me at all because I didn't fucking care. I didn't have a reason to care about killing the Order of the Ancients past Bayek wanting to kill them as well. Other Assassin's Creed's do a better job at making your hit list a tiny bit more involved, put it that way. All right, let me wrap up. I've got a few more thousand words to say before we're done with this video. Assassin's Creed Origins is the first step in this newer era of Assassin's Creed, one in which that the franchise slowly started losing sight of what made it uniquely recognizable to begin with. The gameplay steered away from being in the action-adventure style straight into RPG territory, because if you want to sell copies, make your games look like the other ones. The open world loop definitely suffered from this greed. Instead of having a few set activities for the area you're in, you've now got level gated side quests that draw resources away from the main plot, lengthen out the game much more than what's needed, and 
at the best of times, are a distraction, if not an outright departure, from the game you're meant to be playing. Also, making it a chore to get the endgame armor is what made me finally turn this one off. Unlocking a few special keys as the story progresses, ones that you'll have to keep an eye out for as you're playing through to unlock a big shiny that you'll use in the final stretches of the game and go for that 100% with if you want, that makes sense. The endgame armor in Origins requires you to not only complete the star maps, but also roam around the tombs to collect 50 of this one legendary material, the most of which you can get in a location is three. I don't have time for that fucking bullshit. The soundtrack, however, is definitely something I have time for. Sarah Schnasher, still hard to say, has done an excellent job with crafting a composition that will keep you company on a beat for beat note. I won't call it great because I can't hear any native Egyptian instruments, but that's literally the only thing stopping me from calling it great. Because this OST is gloriously crafted and criminally easy to listen to, unlike the narrative which is very much lacking. The villains are faces on a target board to be snuffed out as you work your way through the plot. Seeing a few famous people you'll recognize just so Ubisoft could say they actually put them in the game. The few noteworthy narrative points are very few and far between. Maybe it's because the sheer number of side quests took away time that could have been spent making the mainline plot, the one everyone will actually experience, a bit more memorable and enjoyable. A good example of what I mean is this. This is Bayak's first recruit into the Hidden Ones. She even shows up in the DLC later. I couldn't tell you her name for the life of me. I don't even know if she appeared earlier in the plot. This is meant to be the moment that the Brotherhood began. Having the inner circle from when Bayak and Aya were betrayed, join the Brotherhood would have made more sense because they've had a leg in the game for longer. I don't know who this person is, and subsequently, I don't give a shit if she becomes an assassin or dies from some burn wounds later on. The larger parts of Origins can fit a single word, boring. Time, however, for the jocks versus the nerds and a blown out of proportion sibling feud. Prepare yourselves, everyone, to meet mediocrities. <laughs> Assassin's Creed The Greek Odyssey was released 343 days after Origins, not even giving the waiting fans a full year before they were subjected to this heinous time sink, which was being developed by the big boy over in Quebec, the same bunch of people responsible for Syndicate if your memory is about as fresh as this franchise's idea for what can pass as a decent plot or character. If you're already getting the vibe that I don't particularly like Odyssey, it's a more complex affair than you would like to know. The problem is, this game is called Assassin's Creed Odyssey, meaning that you should be able to expect some similarities between this and other AC games. It should keep the general theme and feel like it's from the franchise in terms of gameplay and character progression. I'm beating a dead horse with what I'm about to say, but if we're calling this an Assassin's Creed game, it's fucking horrid. About the only things that it's got in common with the larger franchise is the existence of a secret order ready to do whatever it takes to get their way, even though it's still not named the Templar Order. There's the presence of the Isu in some capacity, and a mention of Abstergo in the modern day segments. Notice how I didn't mention an Assassin's Brotherhood at all, nor the presence of a hidden blade. You need to buy a DLC for a nod to the weapon and Brotherhood that make this franchise iconic. You, as the player, never get that nod in the base game. If this game was just called Odyssey, it'd be a time sink of a Greek exploration game, something with an action-adventure storyline about reuniting your broken family, a special spear, meeting a few notable Greek figures from history, and having a merry old time with the crew of your ship on the Aegean Sea. Because of the fact that this has Assassin's Creed at the start of the title, however, I need to judge it as an Assassin's Creed game, both as a fan and a standalone entry in the series. And I know I'm not going to enjoy this. But where be setting? I hear someone crying in the back. Well, it's this little place called Greece. 
specifically in the neighborhood of the Peloponnesian War. Or you could call it the Archidemian War as well, because there's a whole second bout of the Peloponnesian War before Sparta finally wins and replaces the Athenian Empire with one of their own design. But we don't get to see that happen at all. Instead, we're in the front end of this conflict, and it's quite the historical mess because the number of important people your character directly interacts with is way, way higher than any other game in the series. Keeping the trend from Syndicate, Quebec felt it necessary to just front load the game with a bunch of names you might recognize because that's what you're here for, right? Just some historical figures to talk to, not an Assassin's Creed game. From the top, the list of important figures to meet in this game include Alcibiades, or Alcibiades, how the fuck you want to say it, a prominent Athenian statesman and general with a penchant for getting drunk and fucking anything with a pulse. Archidamus II of Sparta, one of the big, big boys who worked out a peace treaty for the first time the Peloponnese neighborhood had a bit of a scuffle. Astophanes, nicknamed the father of comedy. I'll give you a minute to figure out how he got that name. Pericles, one of the greatest Athenians to ever walk the earth, effectively planting Athens as the center of Greece before he finally died. Plato, famous for making a school. Socrates, a man willing to have an argument about damn near anything, also one of the greatest philosophers ever and teacher of Plato. Thespis, the reason we have the term thespian to describe an actor, being that he was the first credited actor ever in history. Sophocles and Euripides, two of the three Greek tragedy playwrights whose work actually survived to the modern day. Leonidas of Sparta, insert meme here. Wait, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, and the reason every doctor takes a Hippocratic oath. Herodotus, credited with being the first real historian, author of The Histories, which is one hell of a book. Brasidas, hunky boy and the most distinguished Spartan officer of the entire war. Democritus, a philosopher who helped putter along atomic theory. Phidas, sculptor of the lost and still amazing statue of Zeus, which was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the last one I'll be mentioning, Pythagoras, who you might know by the Pythagorean theorem in maths. There's more people than what I just listed off, but I think I've stolen enough pictures off Wikipedia for at least one game. If you noticed, there's a few key figures I left out of that list. It's because they're critical to the game's plot, so you might have to play the game yourself to figure out why they aren't mentioned now. But the long story short is that you meet all of these people throughout your playthrough, and only a few of them are critical to the majority of the plot, when you're not busy being a literal demigod anyway. Let me talk about how superhuman you can actually get before you see the credits roll. On the surface level, Odyssey very much shares the gameplay skeleton of Origins, big open world, character levels to get off quests and equipment, which in themselves have independent stats and effects, with a difference between the two being that Odyssey has abandoned a consistent armor set, opting for a system similar to the weapons, with enemies having a chance to drop some pieces of kit themselves. But side quests as well, having some rarer and altogether more useful bits of armor as a reward for wasting your time with them, which can be split between three different playstyles and stat lines just to lengthen out the gameplay a little bit more when you aren't really sure which number you want to see go higher. The most notable waste of time in Odyssey, however, without a doubt, is the Cult of Cosmos. Remember when routing out the enemies of the Brotherhood, punishing the corrupt members of the elite, thinning the herd of the opportunistic and callous was actually the main point of these games? Of this entire graph, which has 44 victims total, unless I fucked up counting, you only need to kill maybe 12 of them throughout the mainline story of Odyssey. And I'm being generous with what I can remember from my run through. Killing the enemy isn't the focus anymore. Wasting time is. That graph is also on top of the multiple side stories you can commit to, not only in traditional side missions where you run an errand for someone in the area, but also in some quests that belong in an MMO, like the quest that requires you to hunt down three pole marks, think of them as garrison captains from Brotherhood, and taking their seals to return for a reward. There's only a few side missions that I actually found worth the fuckery of running around the map to complete. My main example being the Daughters of Artemis quest that took a very, very long time to finish. 
and featured some not so entertaining boss fights. This is all without mentioning the overarching war that holds not only the main campaign, but the larger map of Greece as well. And if you're OCD about which colour you paint the entire map with, oh boy you're in for a bad time. The point I'm trying to make with this bit of my ramble is this. In Origins, if you wanted to complete the main story and maybe stuff around with a few of the side things on your way to the climax, you'd probably be in the game for around 50 hours if you're taking it easy. The time it'd take to do roughly the same sort of thing in Odyssey is closer to 80 hours. Personally, I only spent about 42 in this mediocre and grayscale time sink, if my recording time is to be believed, because this Odyssey is built to waste your time. At any point in Odyssey, you can dive into the marketplace built into every version of the game and spend some Helix credits, those fancy in-game equivalents to the actual money you need to spend to get them, for a permanent boost to either your gold or XP gain by 50%, a full map reveal showing every chest, tablet, and collectible with the push of a button, all for the cost of the money you actually worked for. Which Ubisoft thinks should be in their pocket instead, because charging upwards of 70 bucks for this game wasn't already enough. There's also cosmetic items you can purchase for your character, horse, and ship. These are slightly less sinful in my mind, because they're just a nice visual thing for your vain heart to tie some sort of fake value to. The rest of the market has a tangible impact on the game, and it only exists due to a greedy cunt at Ubisoft thinking their million dollar bank account needs another zero at the end of it. But that's enough of me bitching about the management of a multinational game company however. Let's bitch about the gameplay systems instead, which I've actually only got two real issues with. My first slice of beef is the fact you can outright remove fall damage from the game. Parkour has always been a part of this franchise, from its very inception. It was up to the player to pick the correct route when moving through any given area, because if you pick the wrong path, you'll either lose progress in the chase, have your very angry pursuers catch up to you, or just make yourself look a bit silly. That risk is part of the gameplay. Odyssey sees fit to remove that risk. Not immediately, mind. You do retain fall damage for a short while, but eventually you'll be able to fling yourself off any nearby cliff without any fear of your health dropping even an inch, regardless of whether it's a two-story drop or a headlong plunge from 100 feet in the air. It takes away a certain part of the parkour that always felt like it belonged. Sure, the amount of distance you could fall in previous games was a bit larger than the average person could actually take throughout the franchise. But there was always that dice roll between losing a little bit or a big chunk of your health bar when you miss time a leap or purposefully fling yourself off a ledge. It does make getting around Greece a bit quicker. But if you know your system is going to be so compromised by the world it's featured in to the point where you add an upgrade to get rid of that annoyance, something has gone wrong along the development timeline. My second big issue is that... That... There's no... Fucking... Hidden Blade, the iconic weapon of the franchise from day one, the weapon that has a fair amount of lore built around it and you don't even see it in the base game. There's also a complete lack of regard for a few little things like the generational torch concept that the main character from every game is sowing the seeds for the next generation of assassins, up until you get to Unity anyway, as well as the presence of the Isu being put down to a few mythological creatures you can encounter throughout the map, because this game just needed another thing for you to waste your time on. It's a pretty fucking fat slice of bullshit. For whatever reason Ubisoft wants to give, whether it's because Odyssey takes place well before Origins, or they just wanted to use a different set of animations they had sitting around. Not having the weapon that is the very symbol of your franchise is a pretty big fuck up. Sure, you wouldn't get the reasonably useful teleport assassination power if we had the hidden blade, but you'd have guaranteed assassinations. Not these fucking gambles where you aren't really sure if a critical assassination is going to kill your target or trigger the notice of every fucking guard inside the fort. Because once people notice you're there, I hope you're ready to kill literally everyone in sight, as well as the people who arrive in the middle of combat. 
because until you do, you're not getting out of that fight without a very quick and cowardly flight in a random direction, as fast as you can move. God forbid if you happen to assassinate a cult member inside one of the major cities, because you might as well do your best Jar Jar impression and disappear from existence once the entire populace takes offense to your actions and breaks out the pitchforks in response. If you wanted a nice, hot, spicy take from yours truly in regards to Odyssey, here it is. If you enjoyed the rest of the series up until this point, you can stop now. You probably won't enjoy this game in the same way. I will concede to Odyssey that it is a fun open world Greek adventure game, but it's a pitifully bad Assassin's Creed game. Not only the fact that it abandons key elements that are recognizable to the franchise, but because two of those elements are restricted to DLC, one of which contains the actual end to the game's storyline. And much like Jar Jar being a creature in Star Wars, I find myself asking the question, WHY? FUCKING WHY? Can someone give me a reasonable, logical, actual answer as to why the conclusion of a game that willfully expects you to waste WEEKS of your time to finish the main storyline doesn't even come packaged with said fucking ending? It's fucking bullshit. Sorry, let me compose myself. Hopefully, I'll be as successful as The Flight were in composing the beats and bops for this particular odyssey. The Flight is actually a duo of one Joe Henson and Alexis Smith, hailing from that fossil of a country known as England. Having tread a little bit of water before in this franchise, helping compose some of the multiplayer music for Black Flag, which is a mode I wish the series had kept. They've done some slightly more notable work for two small games known as Alien Isolation and Horizon Zero Dawn. Both of these are pretty good games. Thankfully, the gents themselves carried a bit of that magic from those much better games and injected a bit of it into this venture through history. Carrying the trend over from Origins, The Flight have composed a banger of a track that fires off every time you open the game to dispose of your free time. And thanks to the help of a Greek community member, I've been able to nail down a few of the native instruments featured throughout the comp, starting firstly with a few members of the Zither family. Zithers being a collective term for precursory guitar style instruments most of which helped along with the evolution of the guitar we're familiar with today. Anyway, most of the native instruments belong in this larger Zither family, starting first with the lyre, being probably the most famous individual instrument I'm going to talk about not called a harp. More often than not, the lyre was accompanied by a bit of singing, and it's best to think of it as more of a personal instrument, meant for parties with close friends, a proposal to a lover or something similar. Whereas the big boy harp might be reserved for the wealthy on a big occasion, a great victory in battle, impressing a foreign guest, that sort of thing. He thought of the stairs. He bought a horiket on a leak list on Podo. The next near cousin in this circle of guitar like things is the psaltery, where the lyre and harp have an open neck, for lack of better wording. A psaltery normally has a bit of backing to close in the neck and give the musician something to strum against, much like how the bazooki also had a closed neck. Of all the instruments I'll mention, this is probably the most modern looking to your uncultured eyes, much like how you'll probably be able to pick it out in a track without any real help. Based off everything I've heard from this OST, and my own skewed definitions that I don't at all keep to outside of this series, I'd call the composition for Odyssey great. It has the native instruments that I need for this silly definition of mine, and it does a good job of putting me into the Greek world that the game brings forth. And I'll flat out say it, this is the single best element of Assassin's Creed Odyssey from top to bottom. It's well composed, it's nice to listen to in isolation and in game, it uses native instruments, and it immerses me into the world brought forth. Seal of approval, tick it off, 
she's a good one. Just like how having this little theme play every time you open the menu was a very smart idea. Of the versions of Ezio's family featured thus far in the series, this one is towards the front of the pack. Nothing could ever beat the original in my mind, but having those guitars laced over each other in the beginning before the vocals really hit, and even those iconic string tones having a slight variation in pitch, makes the track stick out a little bit more. I like it. The narrative, however, oh boy, I don't like him. <laughs> There's a few reasons I'm not a fan of the narrative, some of which I've already alluded to in the gameplay section. The absence of any sense of a brotherhood or generational torch in the base game is my second biggest gripe overall. The lacking of a proper ending without downloading a DLC pack that costs 37 bucks on the average day is a much, much larger gripe because cutting off the ending from the base game is bullshit. But what about the story presented? I hear the misanthropes cry. Well, the immediate opening scene is the land battle of Thermopylae. Go watch that Gerard Butler movie for a more interesting recount of this event. Fun fact about this fight, by the by. There was also a sea battle going on at the same time. The Battle of Artemisium, if I've said it correctly. Led by a pretty popular lad named Themistocles. But he doesn't appear in this game, so fuck him. There was also a bit more than 300 troops at this battle. The Spartans are the ones who get the clout, but the 7,000 other Greeks involved in the battle, they don't really get remembered as often for some biased reason, I think. Of course, we all know how this battle ends, and eventually the Spartans lose thanks to a flanking maneuver. But not before you get a very quick tutorial on how to be a Spartan. Then you get an ever so brief section with Layla Hassan and her friend Victoria. Don't get attached. There's a whole lot of one other scene where you actually see her in the base game from memory. Booting back into the tolerable part of the game, we get a very nice flyby alongside an eagle to show off the small island of Kefalonia, your starting region to get used to the controls and scrub up a few levels before you enter the wide world of Greece and realize that you don't even have anywhere near enough holiday leave from work to make a dent in the preceding events to come. This is where you also meet Cassandra or Alexios, respectively, depending on which you chose in the opening of the game. For the purpose of because I said so and I don't want to touch this fucking shit again, Cassandra is our protagonist for this run. And also, it's canon, so go fuck yourself. You bum around the island for about three hours if you're like me and swing for the main story rather than killing time with the side quests. Along the way, unlocking a few flashbacks to Cassandra's earlier life in Sparta, where her family was whole and her daddy actually loved her a little. But once you defeat the Cyclops, the big bad of Kefalonia, you get a significant flashback to the moment that Cassandra's younger brother is hurled off a cliff in Sparta, because that's a thing they used to do. This action was brought upon by a prophecy, because nothing bad ever happened from following the ramblings of a religious nut job. In the heat of the moment, Cassandra pushes the man holding her baby brother off the cliff, leading to both man and child having a very long tumble to meet Mother Earth. This counts as murder in Sparta, so her father is forced to hurl his remaining child to reunite with her brother as paste on the ground. This doesn't go to plan, however, because Cassandra survives the long fall down the mountain and happens upon the broken spear of Leonidas a relic of the Isu apparently, because it somehow attunes to Cassandra's DNA and unlocks some demigod level shit in her genes. Something something, it's the Isu, don't question it too much, something something. You also see the moment that Cassandra's built-in sus detector fails, when she's successfully bribed with food from Marcos. I wouldn't trust him to piss in the right direction, let alone be a good person. Flashing forward to the present day, you follow a lead gained from a private contractor, because Cassandra is a Mystios, which is a fancy title for a mercenary, to track down and kill someone named the Wolf of Sparta. The Wolf happens to be her father, Nikolaus of Sparta. So naturally, Cassandra goes looking for some answers, and one way or another, is told to start chasing leads for her mother, who might know where Cassandra's long-lost brother is. The next 40 to 80 hours of playtime will be spent chasing every fucking lead under the sun of Greece, 
in hopes of tracking down every member of your family and gathering them together for a big old reunite at the very end of the game. One which can very well not happen based off the character's action as the story plays out. You could have your entire family together again or literally murder every member and be alone in the world which is an element of Odyssey I do appreciate. Having multiple outcomes that are dictated by player actions in the world is a fundamental part of any RPG, even if it's a game trying to wear the skin of a much more successful rival. In my run, however, I ticked all the boxes for the best ending possible apparently, because I have fucking foresight or some shit. Like I said, however, in regards to the base game, a lot of the plot can be summed up with a peninsula spanning goose chase in the hopes of reuniting your scattered and broken family so you can have a nice dinner together again. Almost completely ignoring the cult of powerful individuals fighting for absolute control of the region as a whole, which has, you know, kind of been the final objective for every Assassin's Creed up until this point to dismantle the Shadow Council of whichever time period, making sure that the evil and corrupt don't enslave the larger human race. But having dinner with mum, dad, your stepbrother who hates your guts, and your actual brother who's massacred thousands of people and tried multiple times to kill you personally is a bit more important than the betterment of everyone else in this general neck of the woods. Ignoring the fact that the Isu elements of the story, which have also always been a part of this franchise, have now been sidelined to explain away a few legends of the time periods and the demigod status of your chosen protagonist and the upgrade center for your little spear, they have almost a non-existent connection to the rest of the franchise up until you get the DLC. The DLC introduces a whole bunch of Isu nonsense, specifically so you can run around in Atlantis, as well as giving the modern day plot an actual purpose, and, you know, the final conclusion to the main story itself, which I cannot understate, infuriates me to high heaven. So here's the big spoiler for the main game. Nikolaus isn't Cassandra's real father, Pythagoras is, because he's one of the last of the Isu left in the real world and not trapped in Atlantis. Kind of a big plot point for your game, right? Apparently not big enough to include that entire part of the game where you actually explore your ancestral homeland and uncover the artifact that ties into the next game of the series and gives a bit more info into the overarching modern day threat that's only been teased in the background so far. Basically, if you aren't ready to throw down 37 bucks for the privilege, the honor, the downright hedonistic pleasure of experiencing the narrative conclusion of Assassin's Creed Odyssey, you won't actually get a proper ending and you'll be aimlessly wandering the map in hopes of something meaningful to happen to make the 40 hours minimum playtime worth something. With that in mind, I didn't play the Atlantis DLC. I was fucking done. I had wasted enough time in a mediocre plot with a cast of characters I couldn't give 9 tenths of a fuck for, and I wasn't about to start a DLC run that could have taken another 14 hours just to see the end of a game that I had already paid $80 for. I'ma wrap this section up because I think I've wasted enough of my breath on this fucking shit. If you like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, that's cool. You can like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but this is my video, so I'm gonna tell you what I think about it. And Assassin's Creed Odyssey, as an Assassin's Creed game, is the worst in the franchise. As a game, it'll suffice for anyone who has an interest in ancient Greece, because it builds a very beautiful and detailed world for the player to lose themselves in. But on every other merit games are measured by, story, characters, gameplay and soundtrack, it trips over its own feet and smashes its face into the ground with enough force to cause an earthquake at almost every second step. The gameplay retains the third person Souls-like combat, except it's become even more abusable than it was in Origins thanks to the parry mechanic. But its greatest sin is the utter void of content spanning the map, most of which won't be of any value whatsoever by the time the credits finally roll. Even the staple elements of the franchise from day one have been cast as a sideline activity rather than the core focus 
and linking background detail respect. The fact the game has microtransactions built into its DNA to help speed along progress in a game where playing casually and eventually saying, fuck this grinding shit, can still net a playtime close to 50 hours, should tell you everything wrong with this game from a gameplay perspective. The soundtrack, in my mind, is the one saving grace of this entire experience. From top to bottom, the music is enjoyable and easy to listen to, capturing the moments in the plot and making them something ever so slightly more in the mind-numbing movement of pixels. It is absolutely the best part of Odyssey without a second thought, not named Cassandra, who is my favorite element of the entire narrative. Might be because I'm the one controlling her. Might be because she's a buff lady and I'm kind of into that shit. Might be because her voice actor, I think, does a really fucking good job. But if it wasn't for Cassandra, I probably wouldn't have finished this fucking game. Going off that praise, the narrative proceeds to run its face against the ground so hard that it creates a new mountain range. It's a long-winded and boring exercise into reuniting a family that I don't care about. Cassandra might care about them, but there's no other motivation given other than that because family. Cassandra is the best part of the narrative. She is the best character. It's not even close to being a competition, but she can't carry the weight of an entire game on her shoulders, even though they are nice shoulders. Compound the fact that the ending for the game is locked behind an almost $40 paywall, and you've got another reason. This narrative sucks balls. Put that on top of the core narrative elements, ones that have been part of every Assassin's Creed game since the very beginning, being either out of focus, pushed to the side, or completely absent to begin with. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is good for four things. The soundtrack, Cassandra, wasting time, and the discovery tour mode to learn a bit more about the Greek world. Don't fucking buy it if you're looking for an Assassin's Creed game. If you don't know what game to play next and have even a passing interest in Greek history, you might have a good time. For the fans, however, you can completely and utterly miss this game and be none the worse for it. Being worse off, however, was a common trend for the English in the 9th century, as the dragons broke through a clouded sky and made themselves home in a foreign land. A new phrase was bestowed to these poor souls, one that carries weight even today. Viking. Assassin's Creed The Viking One was published in November of the year that shall never be forgotten. Development duties shifting back around to the main hub, the mecca, the front loader for this franchise, Ubisoft Montreal, sharing a large majority of the same team that finished up Origins. Being that this game came out in that ill-begotten year, the role of that nasty little virus of course played a part forcing a sizable chunk of the development team to work from home, which would be a pretty adequate reason as to why, even four months after the game was released, there's still a fair few problems present in the current version. Whether that's indeed due to the big thing that I can't name, which I'm avoiding to say because YouTube censoring, or just Ubisoft being Ubisoft and doing a rushed job like they've very much become known for, who can truly say? And on top of all of that, you've got the exposing of one bastard that I'm not going to name anymore. My biggest problem throughout my runtime was the very rickety stability, giving me no less than 14 hard crashes back to my desktop, which of all the games I've played since I've had my big rig is definitely a fucking record. Was it a part of my PC not keeping pace? Was it the divine whims of Odin being a bitch? Was it the game itself not being made properly? I don't know, but it happened, so I'm gonna tell you so. Just like how Ubisoft is gonna tell you to freely spend your money in the in-game marketplace, still touting the permanent boosters and map reveals featured in Odyssey. It also occurred to me that I neglected to mention the existence of such money-grubbing options in Origins as well. This is me amending that mistake. 
If only Ubisoft and most big name companies could recognize the same mistake, but they're too blinded by the bags of money being thrown at them from these methods of revenue. <clears throat> Uh, where is the setting, please, sir? Begging your pardon, no gentle viewer. There's actually a few different locations you'll visit in Valhalla before the credits roll. As far as time period is concerned, it's in the later days of the 9th century. The main focus for the larger part of your playtime will be southern England, but there's a sprinkling of Norway and America around the block to try and freshen things up slightly. In this specific slice of history, England is in a little bit of a pickle, seeing as there's an absolute swarm of Norse men and women coming from basically out of nowhere as far as the English are concerned to commit a bit of a viking, which is the term used for raiding, because there's not too many crops that can survive the harsh environment of Norway. So you'd normally go viking, to acquire some supplies or maybe some captives to trade away as slaves for gemstones and such. The viking problem in England has gotten to the point where there's more than a few factions of the red-blooded bastards staking a claim to the land and setting up a permanent residence. And I need to cover a bit of background history before we dive into some of the notable characters featured in game. So, game takes place in and around 873 CE. Let's rewind back to around the 840s to when some dude named Ragnar Lothbrok kicked the shit out of Paris and was considered one of the most terrifying men on earth. Ragnar had a few sons, or at least some very loyal followers. These sons made the great heathen army and proceeded to skullfuck all but one of the kingdoms of England. This is where you, the player, controlling the skin sack known as Eivor, make your entrance. Through the eyes of Eivor, you get to meet a few notable figures, even in the starting section of your adventure, the most handsome and notable of which being King Harold Fairhair. Cause damn, look at that hair. Maybe it's human blood. Harold is normally credited with being the first full-blown king of Norway, though it's a bit heavily disputed in recent years because the only real accounts we've got from the 9th century, especially in regards to most of the Norse figures, are super old sagas. And oral history normally has a habit of changing rather drastically as time goes on. You can largely apply this caveat to every other notable Norseman I'm about to mention. They don't call this larger period of history the Dark Age is for nothing after all. However, it is noted that Harald had the name Fair Hair because he refused to cut his hair until he was king of all of Norway. As a bald man, this makes me weep. To back up this king with another king, let's talk about King Alfred the Great. Alfred was the king of Wessex, the only region in all of England that didn't fold to the Viking invasion, as well as being the figurehead to push most of the Norse back out of the country. The biggest note I can find on this man is that of all the kings of England, he's the only one, the only fucking one to hold the title of the Great. There's been a fair few kings of England, some of them have even been pretty good, but Alfred was so good in the eyes of his people, he managed to gain a title that no one else in the history of his nation managed to reach. Pretty fucking good if you ask me. Bumping ourselves up to a three of a kind, we have King Hafdan Ragnarsson, a son of Ragnar Lothbrok, as you might have guessed. One of the leaders of the great heathen army that ravaged England, Hafdan eventually found his place as the King of Northumbria, although historical accounts suggest he might have also been the King of Dublin, maybe even a co-king with his brother Sigurd Snake in the Eye back in Denmark, which reads up as one hell of a resume. Can't say that it quite hit the mark in the game, however. Rounding out our four of a kind is King Guthrum, head boy of the Great Summer Army, the last standing force to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Alfred in Wessex. At one point, Guthrum managed to roll over East Anglia, Mercia, and Northumbria before being put into the ground so hard that he became a Christian, clearly a fate worse than death, and reducing his realm to East Anglia before he died, being heralded as an equal to King Alfred. I can't say the man had a bad run, but losing faith in the cause of Viking is a pretty good way to stop yourself from being a Viking. Enough with the kings, let's talk about a king killer one that you spend a fair bit of time with in-game, and he definitely lives up to his batshit insane reputation in my mind. Ivar the Boneless Ragnarsson. Jesus Christ, I'm glad this man is dead. 
In game, Ivar is shown to have a very fluid and free flowing combat style with the flips and the turns and all that shit, clearly being a reader of the scroll of water. But the more common theory in history is that he was born with either weak or no bones in his legs, hence boneless. Story apparently goes that when Ragnar came back from a raiding season, his third wife, who also happened to be a seer, said, boy, you gotta wait three days before you hit this. Ragnar didn't even wait a single night, and as a result, Ivar was born a cursed baby with no bones in his legs, apparently. You gotta give it to the Norse, their sagas are definitely dramatic. A brother to Ivar and another general in the Great Heaven Army was Ubba Ragnarsson. He is a fucking big man. Supposedly, the prime reason Ubba came to America was to seek revenge for his father's death. A pretty famous saga involving a snake pit and a gent named Edmund. That's about everything interesting I can find on the man. He was big, he fought with Ivar, avenged his father, then died sometime later. He also set the standard for how Saxons would expect Vikings to act, apparently. Closing out the ranks of people you might find interesting enough to do a bit of research on them in your spare time, maybe just to call out some dude on the internet for mentioning them in his video game review, is Rollo. A relatively young lad you meet in Valhalla, but he goes on to be kind of important later in history, settling down in a neck of the woods in the Frankish homeland, which would later be called Normandy. Notable not only for the one time the Americans have invaded a place with half-decent intentions, but also for a little character by the name of William the Bastard, otherwise known as William the Conqueror, which would also tie Rollo directly through bloodline to Elizabeth II and the current royal family of Britain. History is pretty cool sometimes, isn't it? There's a few other kings throughout the map that you'll meet and maybe even crown or kill, but in terms of history and the versions brought forth as you play Valhalla, I think they're all a bit less interesting than their Norse counterparts. I also think I've prattled on long enough with this historical background shit, so let's jump into the gameplay, as copy-paste as it is. It's basically the same. Moving on. Just kidding. The combat has ever so slightly been tweaked to be a bit more weighty than before, and the gear drops from enemies have been completely scrubbed in favour of chests around the map containing both armour and weapons you can switch out and customise as you conquer England. You've still got the semi-souls-like elements to the combat bleeding through with the dodging and the parrying. You've even got a big old stamina bar to manage in the middle of combat, which apparently ties into the weight of the armor you're wearing, but I never actually noticed any real difference between armor sets as I was playing. Mostly, I think they're just for visual things. The various weapons you can pick up throughout the map also have their own different animation sets and ranges of engagement, the shortest being the knives and the longest going to either the spears or the dane axes, all of which have an alternate animation set when you dual wield them with another weapon, or maybe you want to pop a power move and beat your enemies to death with a pair of shields. There's a few different types of enemies you'll be running across throughout the lands of England, most of which won't present too much of an issue once you've gotten their movement patterns down to an art form. There's even a few elite enemies. You'll know these guys by the golden health bar, but the swiftest method to bring these guys down, along with every other enemy, is to target the shiny spots, like a good gamer should be trained to do, or parry them until their stamina is drained and they're open for a stun attack, which, outside of boss fights, should completely nuke their health bar and be the end of the affair. The downside of what feels like a semi-replacement to the counter-kill system, no, I'm not letting it go, is that you've only got a few animations for each enemy type based off which weapon they're using. Be prepared to see these animations a lot more than you need to, and that's not even talking about the normal kill animations you get based off weapon loadout. I also made a very bitchy point in regards to Odyssey about how long the damn game was. While it only took me 42 rough hours to finally finish the main quest and quit torturing myself with that hell, I was expecting Valhalla to be around the same neighborhood, maybe a little bit shorter. <clears throat> 63 and a half hours later, I was made aware of my mistake. 
I'll accept partial blame on this front because I did dive a bit deeper into the order member hunting this time around until I figured out who the Grand Master was just by looking at the outline and then completely lost interest, as well as running around a lot of the map and trying to do all of the Allegiance missions and get all the armor chests I even caught a sniff of. However, if you purely mainlined the story and nothing else, one, you'd be underleveled as fuck for a lot of the areas, and two, you'd have a playtime sitting around 55 hours, which is still quite a lot of time to spend on a game. Quickly mentioning all the stuff you can actually do on the map. There's fishing, the best side activity, hunting down Thor's hammer by killing the daughters of Leron, which are kind of like the lost Drengir and are extremely hard fights to keep pace with, not too dissimilar from the Order Zealots, which you also need to kill alongside the members themselves to finally get to the big bad of the Order, because of course you've got the free time to kill. There's also a few events that are based around puzzles rather than combat, like the standing stones, the cans and the flying Edric bits. I don't even know if I fucking said that right. But they're still not as fly as flighting the rap battles before YouTube and the offering altars that are full of shit because everyone knows the Norse pantheon doesn't exist. Much like how the Animus Anomalies and the Alpha Animals, as well as the rest of these activities, can be completely missed without any negative effects. If you asked me which game between Odyssey and Valhalla I liked more, it's Valhalla because there's an underlying current of actual Assassin's Creed stuff and it's just a bit more fun to play in general. On account of the world, however, I like the look of Odyssey a bit more. I don't know, it's more vibrant and prettier to look at than the dull grey countryside of England, which, if anything, is praise to the environmental design team because England is very dull and very grey. A touted element of Valhalla leading up to release was the settlement portion of the game, which serves in a similar fashion to Monteri Journey from Assassin's Creed 2 or the Jackdaw from Black Flag, giving you a home to customize and call your own, to grow a little community and give you a sinkhole for the resources you gain from the monastery raids because you're a viking after all and raiding is in your blood. The biggest advantage to upgrading your settlement and subsequently raiding the monasteries is the feast mechanic you eventually unlock which grants a lengthy buff to Eivor, boosting stats like health, specific sets of damage and stamina. One of said damage bonuses is for your assassinations, but thankfully someone at Ubisoft had the bright idea of giving people at least the option for guaranteed assassinations. That thing that's kind of one of the pillars of the franchise in general. You also have the bigger battles and assaults on the fortresses as your playthrough rolls along, about only one of which you'll actually use the fire ship you might have seen in pre-release material. All of the assaults are pretty one note however, it's a standard progression from the landing or the front gate where you break the locks and proceed further, maybe you'll break down a palisade along the way or drop a drawbridge, then you'll either face the big boss of the fort himself or a little plot event relating to the overarching story of whichever territory you've been running around up until this point. The main criticism I've got for Valhalla itself is that most of your time is split between the Alliance missions and the actual story missions that tie into the themes you've gotten used to from Assassin's Creed as a franchise. The problem being is that most of the Alliance missions don't need to be completed. They just contain some nice little side moments with some characters you recognize from other regions. But the game tries to tell you it's important by eventually running you into a story mission where all of your allies come together to assist in an assault, which I'm willing to put money on wouldn't be any easier or harder if you went straight for the finish line. Like how we need to start sprinting for the finish line of this fucking video. The beats for this scolding were thrown down by our positive dream team of composers. Yes, but kid, Sarah, sorry, not saying that last name again, and Einar Selvik. Two of the three already having dipped their toes more than once in the franchise before this point, and their new counterpart making the soundtrack for a show that just wrapped up its sixth season and has an 8.5 out of 10 on IMDb. Normally I don't put too much weight on a numbers rating, but that sounds pretty good. Funny thing really, because the OST sounds pretty good too. The 
there's actually more than a few interesting instruments that got thrown into the cooking room when these wonderful composers were doing their thing. But I can only find a single instrument that sits squarely in Norse heritage. This little thing being called a talharp. Fuck knows if I'm saying that right. There were other instruments that have roots in Welsh and Celtic culture as well, being the Swerth and Carnex respectively. But there's also a bit of help rendered by the Eastern European Rebic and a Mongolian modern Kur. You might notice that a lot of these instruments they gathered are string based. And don't worry, it definitely shows in the track themselves. Just like how my lack of understanding of foreign languages shows when I try to pronounce a foreign fucking instrument. I'm pretty sure that this track is the one that fires off whenever you're exploring England and just killing time between all the other plot points in the story. All of the artists have pretty large sections of the OST dedicated to their solo work, with the only example of a collaborative effort I could find being the main theme itself, which you heard a little bit ago. The splitting up of the soundtrack as you roll through its individual numbers doesn't really decrease in quality at all from start to finish. None of the tracks feel out of place or ill-suited for Valhalla as a game. They all have that feeling that they belong. It's a bloody good job from everyone involved, quite frankly. Alright, I'm gonna show you the best track from each individual back to back. Okay, cool. Getting a bunch of talented people to contribute their own bits and pieces to your soundtrack is apparently an outstanding idea. If only games did it more often. It's also worth a mention that I like the sound of Enar's voice so much, I might have to look up his discography for future car trips. But what Assassin's Creed soundtrack section, especially one in my series, would be complete without the mention of that one reoccurring track that just keeps popping up. You know the one, the the big one from the game that launched the franchise. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I like this one more than a little bit. Ringtone worthy material and then some. It's good. Unlike the narrative, which only has a few good parts and furthers what I found to be the biggest example of why Ubisoft needs to up their narrative game. The game decides to kick off the plot with you playing the guise of a child, Ivor, walking around their father's banquet in honor of dad's new best friend or something, witnessing all the levels of usual drunken vikingry and even meeting Sigurd. He's important for a little bit. Anyway, dad gives you a talk thing so you can make your clan look good or something. Then everyone has a bit of a disjointed singing session, right before another clan rocks up and causes some shit, where you get to see how much of a boss bitch your mum is. It runs in the family, trust me. Just like the cowardice of your father, believing for a moment that someone nicknamed the cruel would honor any promise made at all. So, of course, both your parents are killed before your very eyes because motivation or something. But for now, you run away with Sigurd. Not so fast though, because first you decide to have a tumble onto a very precarious bit of ice. 
and get a bit too close to a wolfie before you jam an axe in its neck. This is where the game lets you pick your gender, because choice is a good thing. I chose female Ivor, because every now and again playing as a female protagonist is good. Also, female Ivor is a bad, ruthless, hot as fuck woman. Lucky bastard. Side note, this man is straight up dead. Broken ribs, punctured lungs, being crushed by a boat. Yeah, he ain't getting up. Moving on. Eivor proceeds to engage the latent winter survival ability everyone in Norway has encoded into their DNA, immediately diving from a high point into freezing water with basically nothing on. Meeting up with someone named Dag, who serves as an annoyance and narrow-minded fool for the main part of the game, you go ahead and have your first boss fight to rescue your crew. Then you bugger around for a bit before heading back to your tucked away little home village place which is probably one of the most defensible locations I've seen in the franchise. Because aside from slugging an army over the mountains, which by itself has patrols keeping an eye on it, the only way to get to this little hamlet is straight through the canal, which would negate any large force. And that's in the case of Ivor having an off day, because she could probably take the whole damn army by herself. This is where you meet Randvi, who is best girl not named Eivor, and a bunch of other minor characters that'll be sticking around for about 90% of the story as well. Plus the other dad dude, he's not important. At about this time, you go on a merry little trip to see Valka, who sends you on a rather literal trip for your trouble, complete with a fucking massive wolf and a handless Sigurd. Snapping back to reality, shit, it's gravity, Sigurd rocks up from a two year long raiding trip across the sea in Constantinople, bringing back a few hooded friends made along the way. They seem a bit sus. Sus enough to stick around for a little feast in honor of Sigurd, and even hand out a party gift to Eivor, though she basically tells them to get stuffed when they note she's wearing it wrong. I'd like to remind you that this is very early in the prologue of Valhalla itself, and we've already seen more stuff that's recognizable to the franchise at large than we did at any point in Odyssey. After learning how to stab self with this fancy new toy, Sigurd and Eivor conspire to go fuck up some supplies, owned by the same dude who killed Eivor's parents, and the same dickhead who's threatening her clan right now. And they're gonna do it with or without the permission of replacement dad dude, as you see earlier in the story. So you go ahead and fuck his shit up, before old mate Harold Fairhair is like, oh, What's up fam? Hey, can we borrow some of your troops to fuck over old mate? Yeah, sure. Then you get a nice callback to the very first game and have a prolonged boss fight before your first assault, subsequently thrashing the people who murdered your family. At least until the last dude just disappears into the mist. So you go back to Harold's neck of the woods and get convinced by Basim to pretend at being an assassin for a bit in an attempt to kill Gorm, which Harold generously offers you in the next scene anyway. But it's much more satisfying to let Harold decide his fate, which will result in Gorm being named Worm and exiled from his homeland. Bit of an oof, just cause you wanted someone dead. In this very same scene, Sigurd's dad reveals that he's giving up his land and by effect Sigurd's rightful Yaldum to Harold in a quest for peace, before even telling or asking Sigurd if it was cool to do so. So understandably, Sigurd is a bit pissed when he gets back to his home and finds the king's men have already set up shop, basically throwing up his arms and saying, fuck it. He grabs his loyal friends, Eivor included, showers some promises of better lands across the sea, and then proceeds to fuck off in the general direction of England to set up a settlement and secure some alliances. And that's just the prologue. The next 60 something hours of gameplay will compose almost entirely of that plot point, with the Order of the Ancients eventually being introduced to back up the generational torch angle I haven't really mentioned up until this point. For me personally, the moment you touch down in Ravensthorpe, the overarching beats of the story start sputtering out to a few good moments spread very, very thin until you see the credits roll, just like in Odyssey. Remember when I said this earlier? Unlike the narrative, which only has a few good parts and furthers what I found to be the biggest example of why Ubisoft needs to up their narrative game. What I meant by that little jab is that these three new games, this particular gripe is less of a problem in Origins, but they all use in-game, in-engine cutscenes most of the time for your interactions with other characters. This 
in my mind, is the biggest reason I couldn't give too much of a fuck what happens on screen at too many points at all. Eivor might sound like she's having a normal conversation, but the preset animations that have been carried over from Odyssey make it look like she's in an amateur debating match. It makes it harder for the game to inject any real character to, you know, the core character of the story. If they're just using a relatively basic set of animations that can just be recycled at will depending on what's needed. In the few moments there's actual cutscenes used, the personality that bleeds through in them is like a shot of adrenaline to wake you up from the tedium of seeing the same animations on repeat, and that's outside of the combat. Here's an example of what I mean. It's from the start of the game, so there's no real spoilers here, but if you've gotten this deep into the video, I'd like to think you don't give a shit about spoilers anymore. Hey, hey careful with that one. Hey, bud! Seagate! <laughs> oh, look at you, blood-soaked drinker. Oh, have you been worrying without me? Ah, oh, and you... Salt-cured viking at <laughs> I smell the stink of a dozen kingdoms in your beard. It's just the start. <laughs> Rangvi, my dear wife. Your husband returns. Bringing gifts and riches to share. This scene has little bits of character sprinkled in it that don't need much thinking to unveil. Note the fact that Sigurd doesn't even look away from Eivor at any point even when he pushes the random dude out of the way. And the hug they have isn't the quick, oh yeah, it's good to see you, mate. It's like Eivor and Sigurd are pulling at each other. It's only a little bit of a tilt, but I'ma run with it. Then when the hug breaks, they're still both inside each other's personal bubble. There's definitely a bit of mutual respect and kinship between the two, because how many people do you know that you'd let touch your face even before the dark times? Compare how Sigurd treats Eivor at this moment to how he treats Randvi, where Eivor gets a bit of a bellowing call out. Randvi gets a tone that I can only describe as, oh yeah, that wife of mine. Like, sis didn't even get a hug from her husband. She didn't even get a fucking kiss on the mouth. That speaks to the different levels these two people hold for Sigurd. One is his longtime friend and most loyal warrior. The other is his wife and not even by his choice, as it's hammered home later in the game. The second little moment I'm gonna call out is the scene where Eivor meets Rollo. For context, Eivor is helping a nobleman get rid of his noble wife out of mutual disdain so he can marry his childhood sweetheart. The plan being that Rollo is going to take the noble wife back to her homeland across the sea. Some place called France. I don't know, apparently it's important to world history. Anyway, yes, Eivor is tasked to find Rollo and get him ready to ferry the kidnapped lady back home as part of the ruse. This is the scene. Please, I'm just a poor Christian brother with nothing left to give. Someone's at the door, Rollo. Oh, is it that hun I asked for? Estrid sent me. Did she now? As a parting gift for the man who rattled her bones, huh? <laughs> no, I'm here to collect you. Can it wait? Oi! Bring out the one they call Rolo. The king's men want to ask him a few questions. No, 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 no! Just a second! Good day, sir. Come in. Move! Move! Some help here! Bloody fucking Danes! Open this door! Out! Now! Follow me! <laughs> the moment Eivor enters this den of debauchery, she doesn't look phased or uneasy at any point. It's just part of the job to roll up on a man being lewdly toyed with by a lady holding a whip. She's so unhindered by the whole thing that she casually starts eating a random apple, and the way she says that, I'm here to collect you, just gives me a vibe that if Rollo wasn't need for the job, she wouldn't care nine-tenths of a fuck for who he was. 
And that's coming right after Rollo suggests that she's some sort of prize for giving the noble wife a good fuck. Then when the soldiers start banging on the door and Rollo panics a little, Avil has this little smile on her face as she goes to answer the door, right before lining Homeboy up for a new skull. Little moments like that speak one thing to me about Avor. She knows exactly what she's doing and how she's going to get to her goal. But that charm is lost the minute you introduce the rushed animations from Odyssey into the actual game world. It robs talented actors the chance to breathe a bit more life into the character that has plenty to give just not enough to last close to 60 plus hours. And there's also this funny bit with the chickens I enjoyed quite a bit. Sorry for the drunk filter the game uses, it's a bit how you going. What I'm about to say could very well be applied to all three of these recent AC games. There's good narrative moments in here, ones filled with character that make them more than just a cardboard cutout, but they are all far too in between when compared to the sheer quantity of sections that don't really contribute anything to the story other than to add a few laughs or a bit of drama. Speaking of drama, ever so quickly, Dag, this man is an idiot. During the plot, Sigurd is captured, or escorted you could say, and even though you, as Eivor, are pursuing leads to find him whilst ensuring alliances to help protect your little settlement, Dag thinks you're going for a power grab, somehow, while he does a whole lot of fuck all in the grander scheme of things. So of course, he demands a duel to the death and gets killed for being an idiot. Genuinely, I don't understand the logic this man is trying to commit to. If Sigurd has known Eivor his entire life and trusts her enough to rule in his stead while he's away, maybe you should take that vote of confidence and let her do a thing. Especially when she states multiple times that she's trying to save Sigurd from his captor, while you sit on a boat with your thumbs so far up your ass you could use your tonsils like a set of punching mitts. There's also the issue of Basim. Now, I normally have the rule that if I can't figure out something in the game through lore or otherwise, then it probably shouldn't be in the game. Basim is the idol of that fucking rule. So, at the end of the game, you're portrayed by Basim in the Isu bit of the game, this big thing with the whole Valhalla portion and everything. Basim comes out of nowhere to have a fight with Eivor because, hang with me on this, Eivor, Sigurd, and Basim are all reincarnations of Isu named Odin, Tyr, and Loki, respectively. Basim is the reincarnation of Loki, Norse god of trickery, who is also an Isu because of fucking course he is. This is also apparently the reason that Odin kept popping up throughout the game, because Eivor is Odin, technically. Eivor even has a fight with her inner Odin when she tries to leave the machine, and Odin wants to stay because some reason. That's not even the part that makes me mad. The part that makes me mad is that somehow this is all part of Basim's plan to be put into the device so that Layla can come back after a thousand and a bit years wait to bring the staff of Hermes to him, which in itself holds the spirit of Althea, Loki's Isu lover, which is a detail you straight up wouldn't know unless you've played the Atlantis DLC in Odyssey or browsed the wiki. Just so Basim can basically resurrect himself in the modern day and want to meet William Miles for reasons. If you wanted to know the point of the plot, I can't help you. I straight up missed the point of this game. The plot has entirely and definitely gone straight over my head, and I've still got so many questions. Like why is Althea in the fucking staff? And how the fuck does a Norse Isu meet a Greek Isu? I get that the Isu can have some pretty far-reaching plans in terms of time, but your plan hinges on the fact that Layla drops the staff in the right spot when she enters those ruins. Otherwise, once Basim drops out of the machine, he ain't getting back up. It's, it's, what the fuck is this plot? Also, also, real quick before we move on, let's talk about a line from Dear Layla. Our lovely Layla Hassan that drove me all the way up and actually made me scream out loud in real time. Let's watch. All of this is starting to make sense. Everything I've done. Everything, everything you've done. Learned, everything. What have you done? Go swimming once? What the fuck?
Assassin's Creed Valhalla, there's some good bits. The gameplay, kinda like the franchise at large, is a mixed bag. The combat is nice and weighty and gives you more than a few options for both armor and weapons you can run with until the game's finished, but at the same time, repeats both enemies and animations far too much for its own good. I can only see a sword being driven through someone's chest so many times before it gets old. On that same note, the map suffers from Ubisoft's greatest sin, quantity over quality. Once you've stacked a can stone the first time, it's not going to change the fifth time it happens. Once you've killed a zealot, they won't be all that different from the others aside from moveset. Once you've played a modern Assassin's Creed, the ones after it won't look all that different. Just like how the soundtracks are honestly my biggest point of praise for every single game. Regardless of how good the gameplay loop is, the quality of the narrative experience, or how fun the game itself is, the soundtrack has always consistently, with next to no deviance, been fucking A class. And the work brought forth here doesn't disappoint. It's one of my favorite compositions overall. Does enjoy. Best part of Assassin's Creed. And you can take that quote to the fucking bank. Unlike the narrative, which you'll want to cash out of immediately because of how little substance it ultimately holds. A few good moments here or there, sacrificed for an abundance of side stuff to clog up the hours in your life that could be put to better use drinking lead paint. I'll say it. Bayek, Cassandra, and Eivor are all wasted on this franchise and deserve better narratives dedicated to them. If I sound incredibly harsh and salty, I am. I've been playing this franchise since day one. I've grown up with it. I've seen every ebb and flow and change of mechanics, engines, and development teams. I've been spending hours with this creative work for weeks at a time for the last 14 years. I started playing when I was 11 years old. And when I turn 25 in just about a week's time, I'll still be playing it. I love this franchise. I will keep playing these games until there's no more. I have a fucking tattoo of this franchise on my arm for a reason. I buy these games like it's a habit, because it is. For all the criticism I heap upon Assassin's Creed, it comes from a place of love, of want for it to be as good as I know it can be. I don't enjoy the mindless combing of the map like I used to. I don't have the free time to open up a checklist and do everything these games have to offer. I've gained responsibilities. I've grown up. Assassin's Creed hasn't. It's stuck in a horrific tire spin where it's only every three or four games that the mechanics and structure really changes, and every game in between is there to buy time. I love these games. I adore the ability to wander ancient Greece, to ride through the deserts of Egypt, to sail the rivers of England, to walk through Constantinople, to marvel at the ruins of Rome, to explore the canals of Venice, to see the brutality of the Crusades, the sheer majesty of Notre Dame, the shimmering seas of the Caribbean, the potential of the American colonies, and their fervor for independence. But now I can barely tell if there's any other part that's worth the effort. This franchise should have ended years ago. And I'm scared that we're at the point now where it's impossible for it to go back. I love Assassin's Creed, but I think its story needs to end sooner rather than later.